Good evening, friends. I'm really excited for our Thursday devotional. It should be about 5.30 p.m. when this comes out. And hopefully you are watching it before the next one comes out next week so you're keeping track. This is going to be our last lesson on genealogies. There's a lot more we could say, but we're going to leave it here for now. I'd like to move on. And next week we're going to start talking about salvation. I want to talk about doctrine. I don't normally do doctrinal emphasis, but I want to talk about the doctrine of salvation, how it works. I think that's really, really important, and it's something I'd like to emphasize in some coming lessons. And hopefully after that, we can progress back to the Psalms. If anybody is missing our study series in the Psalms, we'll be getting back there. So this is a bit of a transition lesson from, transition devotional to be more accurate, from our little talking on genealogies to be talking about the mystery of what it means to be saved. And our text comes from 1 Corinthians Chapter 3, verses 21 to 23. That's 1 Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 21 to 23. Let's introduce the book of Corinthians. Scholars think it was written about 55 AD, and they believe Paul wrote it while he was in Ephesus. That's what they think. And Paul, he wrote this letter because the Corinthian church was facing some paralyzing issues. And the key issue they were facing is division. They were facing division. And so Paul, throughout the letter, he addresses, if you will, the meaninglessness of division in light of their new identity as the familia dei. That's the Latin phrase for the family of God. The family of God. There was this understanding, it's in the Gospels, it's in the Epistles, it's everywhere in the Bible, that as a believer, as a Christian, we are part of God's family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are all related in Christ, the family of God. So Paul in this discussion of the family of God really has a genealogical background that he's working with, and he works with it a lot. He works with it a lot. And when we see this background, maybe we can understand passages in Romans, even passages in Ephesians a little bit better. So how about we read our passage, then we're going to pray and then we're going to get into detail on this discussion. So if you have your Bible, you can go with me. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 21 to 23. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Let's begin. So let no one boast in men. Or humans, for all things are yours, whether Paul, or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or the present, or the future. All are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. Let us pray. Almighty God, we just ask that you unfold this scripture like a flower that we may understand more deeply the truths of your word and have an appreciation for genealogies and the significance of our salvation in our lives. We praise you, God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible from the beginning has genealogical content in mind. In, in Genesis, there's a large number of genealogies. In fact, you can divide up the book by where the genealogies occur. And as we were looking at in First Chronicles, there's a lot of genealogies there at the beginning there. There's genealogies at the beginning of Matthew. They're also interspersed almost randomly throughout. There's one at the close of Ruth that is very, very special, very, very wonderful to read. But probably the two most important ones are the ones in Matthew chapter 1 and the one also in the Gospel of Luke. There, those genealogies show the birth of Jesus Christ. So God had genealogies on his mind when he wrote Scripture. And there are two, if you will, classes, generally, of genealogies. Genealogies often trace physical descent. Who is descended from who physically? They often give a, a literal accounting. So, for example, to be a high priest, you have to be descended from Aaron. That's kind of the general understanding. We tend to understand that genetically, though not necessarily. Because genealogies also have another class, and they, they overlap. But they also have another class, and that is a legal classing, a legal categorizing. We may say a legally recognized descendant 
versus someone who is not a legally recognized descendant. Now, very often, these are physical descendants. Sometimes, though, they are people who are not physically related, but are legally related and legally brought in. And that legal relationship, that God recognition, the government of God recognizes you as part of that family, is of greater significance, is of greater significance, I repeat, than the physical descent. We see that with Abraham. All right. Abraham has two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. They're both his children, and the Lord loves them both. But one inherited the promise. One was legally recognized to carry on that promise, Isaac. And that legal recognition trumped, defined, and was more important than any other. In the genealogy of Jesus Christ, we have Rahab, the Canaanite, who has no business by descent being among the family of God, the people of God in the Old Testament, the Jews, but legally, because it's two, ca two categories, two classes, legally, she's incorporated in. And she has just as much standing as the others. Ruth, the Moabitess, also included in that genealogy. Though she is not originally of the children of Israel by physical descent, is legally incorporated in. Jesus does this genealogical miracle when he looks at us, who are descended from Adam and says, I want you to pray, our Father, who art in heaven. Jesus is the only one who has come from God. He's the only one descended from God the Father in that pure way. He's the only begotten Son of God, the only unique in his kind, in his genus, however you want to describe it. There's none like him. And yet he turns around and says, I want you to pray like how I pray. I want you to pray like how I pray, because Jesus through his cross, through his blood, satisfied the legal demands of the government of God to transition our names from the book of death to the book of life, from the genealogy of Adam to the genealogy of Christ, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to the cross, from the crowns of gold and riches and wealth of this world to the crown of thorns, to the blood of Adam, to the blood of Christ. That's what Jesus did. He made a genealogical transition in everyone who believes in him. That's why in John, it says that we are born again from above. We have a new genealogy. We have a new reckoning. We have a new legal descent. We are new in Jesus. That's what he's talking about. And since we're in Jesus, we can put the question, and this is the question for today's video, what do we gain by our descent from Christ. What do we gain by our descent from Christ? What do we get from being born again from above? What happens? What, what is ours? And the answer is all things are yours in Christ. Well, how does that work? How can all things be mine? Is this prosperity gospel? Is this meaning I go out on the street and I see the Ferrari and the Ferrari is mine if I just claim it, if I just name it, if I say it? God undoubtedly does bless his people with things, but that's not what this verse is talking about at all. This book of 1 Corinthians that Paul wrote for pastoral issues, it's dealing with division in the new legal entity, if you will, of the familiar day, incorporated by the cross, the family of God defined by the cross of Jesus Christ, those who believe. In this family, there were divisions, which it should not be. People were claiming, well, I have a better pedigree than you. I have a better pedigree in the family of God because when I became a Christian, when I was baptized, note the essential nature of baptism in Paul's thinking and in Paul's theology. He said, they said I was baptized by St. Peter. I was baptized by Cephas. I have a super spiritual pedigree. You were just baptized by the regular minister. You, you, your baptism is inferior to mine. I'm of a higher rank in the familiar day. And Paul says definitively, by one spirit, you are baptized. And he's obviously got Matthew 3 on his mind when the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus at Jesus' baptism. Even the Son of God has the Holy Spirit for his baptism. And so you and I, who are believers in God and baptized, we have the same spirit. Doesn't matter if it's Cephas. Doesn't matter if it's Paul. Doesn't matter if it's Apollos. We have the same origin born of the Spirit. And of the water. The Holy Spirit at our baptism incorporates us 
It initiates us. It brings us into the family of God. The essential nature of baptism in Paul's understanding can never be underplayed. Because from this little reference to baptism, a discussion which took place in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul then goes on to talk about that because of this work of God in your life, because you're the familiar day, because there's a different family table, the communion table, because you have a different food, the bread and the wine, the body and the blood of God, because you're different, you belong to Christ. You're incorporated in his descent, in his genealogy. And so all things that are Christ's are yours and everything belongs to Jesus. What does Paul have in mind? Paul has in mind the second coming of Jesus Christ. He talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15. One day Jesus will return. And he will receive all rule and all reign and all authority. And all things will be subjected to him in their totality. And when Jesus comes, we will be there with him and in him, one with him. Part of the familia day, the family of God. That's what we gain by our salvation. Everything. We entrust ourselves to he who is the first and the last. He who was, who is, and who is to come. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so when the Bible makes a promise that all things are ours in Christ, it means through the cross, through the blood, through our obedience, through the Holy Spirit, through the satisfaction of the legal demands of God, we have been moved from a family of death to a family of life. The wages of sin have been paid by Jesus on the cross and we are given a new status, a new citizenship, a new family, a new identity. There is an old man, our physical descent, but there is a new man, our legal descent from Jesus Christ. And we need to live in that new life every day. And so all this talk about genealogies, you see it underpins the whole gospel story. It lays a foundation for understanding our place in our relationship with God and how it is that we become part of the family of God. How it is that we become born again from above. How that beautiful promise comes to be. Every believer, it doesn't matter your earthly situation. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, sick or healthy, because you have a predestined future, because Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign, and Pilate, ain't nobody can stop him, because nobody has any authority that is not given to them from above. And there's going to come a day when the Lord is going to remove the authority that a man has over other men. He's going to remove these authorities, and he's going to give it all to Jesus Christ. And he's going to subject everything under the feet of Christ. And Jesus will reign over all. That's the resurrection of the dead. That's the future hope of every believer. And since that is an inevitable event, we as newly born again, we need to reorient ourselves from the old life to the new life. We're of a different genealogy. We have a different inheritance. We have a different destination. We have a different book. And we have a mission to spread the good news that you can change your family from death to life. That you can change your destiny from hell to heaven through faith in the cross of Jesus Christ according to the preaching of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Amen, my friends. That is what I feel so heavily on my heart to share with us this Thursday devotional. I hope it's a blessing to you. How about we pray? Let me just summarize it. What do we gain from our descent from Christ? What do we gain from this new birth, this being born again in Jesus? The answer is everything. And so it requires a total change in our thinking. A total change in our thinking. Let me give you this analogy to close. If you were born into a family of doctors, you'd have a different way of thinking about your future, about what is expected of you. You'd have a different way of thinking about everything. Your life would have a different orientation. You would live in a different place than if you were born of a family of mechanics, 
which would orient themselves in a different way, which would pursue a different path, which would direct you in a different direction. This is just in general. We have different environments by where we are born. And so when God legally takes you, and He legally removes you, and He moves you from humanity to the family of God, from the family of Adam to the family of God, why are you living in the old house? Move to the new house. Move in to the house of God. Get that new life. Get it and don't sell it in Jesus' name. How about we pray? Almighty God, we just ask that you bless your church and be with us as we go this week. We praise you and we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace, my friends. We'll see you next week. I hope this little talk was a blessing to you. Take care, friends. And God bless.